Okay, one moment. Just getting ready to record a podcast episode and thought it might be fun to do it as a little bit of a live stream on the page as well. But I've just realized I haven't put in my input. So here we go. Just give me one moment while I do the intro to the podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Private Practice with Soul podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brooklyn Storm, and it is super nice to be here with you today, especially because I feel like it's been such a long time since I've done a podcast episode that wasn't in the car. <laughs> um, so as you can see, we're in my study today, and whoo, who's that? That's Buddy. And um, hopefully this is Buddy's very first time with a podcast recording. So normally it was Uncle Gabe, but now he's transitioned over the Rainbow Bridge and we've got little Buddy. So hopefully he's going to be good. Um, if he starts barking or anything, I'll just move him out and pop him to bed. But anyway, what I want to talk with you about today is... Um, uh, two things. I want to give you some tips that are going to help you get more clients through your marketing so that that can really help you. Um, and the other thing that I want to do as well is just clarify a couple of things for you that I think will really help you if you're a counsellor um, in private practice. So without any further ado, let's just go. If you're watching the live, hi, welcome. Um, my podcasts usually go for about half an hour to 45 minutes or so. So you don't have to watch the whole thing. I won't be offended. You can come back and listen to it later or you can just grab the uh, recording on the podcast. Okay, so oh, the name of the podcast is Private Practice with Soul, by the way. All right, so here's the thing. Uh, I'm an admin of, uh, well, I think it's quite a big community of counsellors and one of the things that happens in there in terms of discussion is there's often a lot of talk around, you know, from counsellors in particular, around the fact that um, they believe that psychologists have it so much easier. They really believe that, not all of them, I'm, I'm just talking about this for the moment, but they really believe that for some reason it's like psychologists and accredited mental health social workers have the lion's share of referrals simply because they're on Medicare. I think there's a narrative that goes something along the lines of they don't have to market, they don't have to do anything, they just get all of the work. Um, it's not fair. Clients can go and see them because they get rebates, so it's cheaper and things like that. So I just wanted to share a little bit because I'm in the unique and wonderful position of having been um, on both sides, so both a psychologist and counsellor. So I've got an insight and I want to share it with you. I just want to preface it by saying it's only my experience, it's only my view, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of people with different experiences and views, okay? But here's what I think, you know. I was talking to a girlfriend the other day and we were talking about um, wait lists and she was saying to me, you know, um, or I shared with her how somebody else had said to me that the feedback they'd gotten from somebody they were working with was that they were really excited to be able to connect with the counsellor because a psychologist in the area um, put them on a wait list and, you know, it was going to take six months to see them. And my friend said that's just incorrect like you know what's happening now is that there are actually quite a number of practices that have availability that can actually see clients right so there's a number of psychologists and perhaps accredited mental health social workers that have availability i.e they're not fully booked okay now the other thing to understand too is um, something that's often discussed in the counselling community is, you know, if we're on Medicare, we could provide it free. We could provide the counselling free to people. And I just want to give you a little bit of an insight as to what that looks like. When I started on Medicare, I can't remember. I think it was such a long time ago. It might have been that we got $68 um, for a 50-minute session. I think now, I just looked it up the other day, it's something like $93. Um, now, if you're a psychologist and you're doing bulk billing, i.e. doing it free so the client isn't paying anything out of their pocket, your, your payment, if you like, is the Medicare rebate. Um, 
you're only getting $93 for a session, whereas the counsellors are getting $150 plus for a session, okay? So when you're working as a psychologist and you're bulk billing, you need to see quite a high or you need to book quite a high volume of clients in. Why? Because when we're bulk billing, there's often quite a high non-attendance rate. When there's a non-attendance and you're bulk billing, you don't get a cancellation fee, usually. You don't. And here's the other thing, you can't prepay. So, you know, in counselling, as counsellors, we get clients to pay for their appointments at the time of booking them. Psychologists who work under Medicare, for example, aren't able to do that. They can't say when you book your appointment, it's going to be $200 or something. They can't do that because, um, well, they can, but they can't process a rebate to the client because the service hasn't been provided yet. So there's all these kinds of complexities that surround the billing and the finances when you work as a psychologist under Medicare or a mental health social worker under Medicare. The other thing um, to be aware of as well is that there's a lot of administration that's non-billable. You just don't get paid for it as um, somebody who's working under Medicare. If somebody comes to you with a GP mental health care plan, for example, you need to send a letter to the doctor to say, yes, I'm going to accept the referral or no, I'm not. You need to then do um, progress reports, progress review, um, discharge summaries. You need to perhaps liaise with the doctor, depending on the nature of things. All of these administrative tasks take time and you can't bill for those. So number one, you're, you're booking a high volume of clients um, and praying that they're going to turn up. And number two, you've got now all this extra work that you've got to do somehow, perhaps even in your personal time, that you're not going to get paid for and you cannot charge the client for doing them, right? That's just a mental health care plan. The other um, um, Medicare thing that psychologists and mental health um, social workers often work under is called a chronic disease management plan. So it used to be called an enhanced primary care plan or EPC. These can be nightmarish. And the reason for that is because um, when the doctor fills it out, right, um, the doctor has the option on that form of allocating a certain number of sessions. I think from memory, it's five sessions they've got. So that doctor might say, oh, well, you can have one session with the dietitian, two sessions with the psychologist, one session with the exercise physio and one session, you know, with somebody else that's under Medicare. And so what happens then is, um, oh, and an enhanced primary care plan or a chronic disease management plan covers a 20 minute consult, right? So if you're bulk billing, now you've got the ethical dilemma. Do I just see someone for the 20 minutes, which is what I'm getting paid for? Or is it more ethical for me to only accept the payment for the $20 but provide a 50-minute session? The payment for a chronic disease management plan or EPC was, when I was doing it, about $50. Bucks. Um, so not much money at all. Plus, there's all this extra admin with that too. So as soon as the psychologist or the social worker receives that um team care arrangement or the EPC or CDM, straight away they've got to send a letter to the doctor um, and then they've got to, um, to say they've got it and yes, they're on board and they're going to do everything. Then they've got to send another one to say um, what the presentation of the patient was like and what the treatment goals are. And then they've got to do another one for when they finished working with the client. So it's a lot of paperwork for maybe two sessions. There's ethical dilemmas around it. There's financial dilemmas around it. And again, if they're only getting paid about $50 for doing that session, is it worth it once they have to take out room rent, superannuation, PD, registration, insurances, all of that? They're probably walking away from that session with about 10 bucks. It's not even minimum wage. And these beautiful souls all have master's qualifications or higher, right? It doesn't make any sense. So I don't understand why counsellors 
seem to think that, you know, Medicare is the golden ticket and all their problems are going to be solved and they'll just be able to provide all services free. You won't. It, if you're going to do bulk billing, you are going to need to see more than three or four a day. Trust me, I was there. You're going to need to book so many every day and hope that they all turn up. Okay, so there's that. The other thing too is, um, just in psychology anyway, there's two tiers. So you can go and see, a, a your, your client can go and see a, a general counsellor and they can get $90 back for their sessions or they can go and see a clinical psychologist and get maybe nearly, uh, um, I think it's 132 or 137 so say 140 bucks back. I know if I'm a client where I'm going to go, you're going to go where you're going to get the most money back. So think about that. And if they're the rebates that um, psychologists are getting and then social workers, I think, are about, usually they're about $10 um, less, what do you think Medicare is going to pay counsellors? Probably not that much. I think if you're a counsellor on Medicare, you could be looking at a bit at between $40 and maybe $50 a session. So it's something that's really important for you to understand. Medicare is not a cash cow. It's not going to solve all your problems. The other thing too is that when you're delivering services under Medicare, um, you can be audited by, Medi by Medicare at any time. And so an audit looks like them coming down to your practice. Well, of course, they notify you first, but they come down to your practice and you hand over your files and you show them your computer system and all of that sort of stuff. And they check everything. And you might have seen so you know, usually with Medicare, you see a client six times and then you do a review and then the doctor says, yes, I'll give them another four sessions. So then you get to see them for another four sessions. So they've had usually, usually 10 sessions with you. Now, if Medicare auditors check your files and they see an error, that psychologist has to repay Medicare, not for that single session where the error was identified, but for all the sessions that you as a psychologist claimed rebates for. So um, if, for example, this, this one is quite common actually, when you um, receive a referral, that referral is usually a referral letter from the doctor. Some doctors just don't date them. Or some doctors might not put all the relevant information on there, right? But you're used to seeing like so many of these letters come through. Maybe you're just having a bad day and you don't pay attention. And maybe the doctor hasn't written the date on that referral letter. But you see the client, you see the client 10 times. Now, all of a sudden, the auditors have come and said, hey, um, just looking at the referral for patient ABC and notice that the doctor hasn't put a date on this letter, um, you, you need to pay us back. How many sessions did you have? Oh, you billed, you billed us for 10. Great. So you're going to need to pay back those 10 rebates now. And here's the thing, the psychologist has to pay them back. Um, and so you're out of pocket now, 10 times $90 rebates or 10 times $140 rebates. So it's adding up. And then you can't even go to the client and say, hey, just got, just got audited by Medicare, going to need you to give me back some money. You can't do that. It's your cost to bear. Now, Medicare, generally, I haven't checked lately, but I help psychologists with their Medicare audits all the time, but haven't done one since November. So that's like four or five months-ish and things could have changed. I don't want to give you the wrong information, but normally they audit about 10 files. Now, if you've got, it's really normal for people to have errors in three or four of those files. So if you've seen three or four clients 10 times at $140 rebates each, that's so much money. I can't even calculate it because I'm recording on my phone. That's so much money. It's just going to come out of your bank account. You've got to find that somewhere. There are psychologists and social workers on payment plans to Medicare to pay back debts because all these things happen, right? There are also some psychologists that um, didn't understand about 
prepayment and things like that. So they were taking um, prepayment at the time of booking and set up Halaxy or Clinico or Power Diary or whatever software they were using to automatically process the rebate. And so what was happening for them was they were getting in, into trouble because it was like a fraudulent transaction because no service had actually been provided. Therefore, why are you rebating? Make sense? So yeah, Medicare is tough. The other thing too is that, as you know, um, Medicare, like like many other funding bodies, I'm not down on Medicare. It's not that I'm just bringing it to your awareness because I feel like so many counsellors don't understand what's involved and I want you to be educated and, and have that awareness so that when the time comes, you can make a choice about whether or not you want to be on it or not or under it, whatever the language is. Um, uh, I think I've just forgotten what I was going to say. I'll come back to it. Um, yeah, so look, I think the the gist of Medicare is probably really good and I, I appreciate it can absolutely be helpful for people. But did you know there are so, oh, that's what I was going to say, the treatment modalities are prescribed. So you can only use the treatment modalities that Medicare, in this case, because we're talking about Medicare, um, allow you to use. Now, that just sits so wrong with me that a government department can sit there and dictate to me a therapist with a PhD, 14 years of university education, 30 years in, in the profession, can tell me that they know better than I do about what treatment my client needs when they've not even met my client. They're saying, well, you've got to use this modality or that modality or this one or that one. And I'm thinking, okay, 30 years is a lot of PD. 30 years is a lot of extra learning and education and knowledge and practice wisdom. Surely I'm an expert in mental health. Surely it should be up to me and my clinical judgment as to what treatment is best going to help my client in that session to feel better or achieve the goal or whatever it is that they're wanting and needing. Unfortunately, it's not the case. You don't have sovereignty over how you work. It's very different. When you're a counsellor, you get to choose. You can have this really beautiful eclectic um, approach. You can draw upon a bit of act and sprinkle in a bit of mindfulness. You can use a bit of hypnotherapy. You can do all these different things. And your clients are so, so, so lucky because you're customising treatment for them. This is something that you cannot really do under Medicare because unless Medicare um, approves of the treatment that you want to use, um, you can't do it. You can't use it and you can get into big trouble for using it. So it's important to understand that as well. I think it's really interesting that you know, I, well, I'm just speaking again from my experience, but since I um, released my registration in 2020, which interesting, I should do the numbers on this as well, because it was September 20, 2020. So I'm sure a numerologist out there is going to tell me something very, very exciting about those numbers. <laughs> I don't know what a six means in numerology. But anyway, um, since that time, and since sharing my story about how I transitioned out and away from psychology, do you know how many psychologists have come to me and said, can you help me do the same thing? Do you know how many of them I've helped get out of psychology and move into the counselling and consulting spaces? So many. Why are they moving out? I want you to know so many psychologists do, sorry, just bang the microphone. So many psychologists do use Medicare and they work under it, right? Totally fine. Totally okay. Don't have any issue with that. And it's not the only thing. Um, you don't have to work under Medicare as a psychologist or a mental health care social worker. In fact, um, don't have to work under it at all. You might choose to be totally private and never, ever, ever have anything to do with a funding body. You might never touch NDIS or work safe, or victim services, or Medicare. You might just be like a counsellor in that you just totally free ball and go your own way. You can absolutely do that as a psychologist and as an accredited mental health social worker. The challenge is, I think, 
how do I find the clients then if I don't work under Medicare? I think that's what happens for some psychologists and that's how they slip into the trap, if you like, of working under it. Now, this is just my experience and I'm sure that there'll be other psychologists that say, I love Medicare. <laughs> And maybe they do. And if so, that's so good and I'm so happy for them. But I'm speaking from the perspective of the ones who don't and I'm showing you what it really looks like on the other side. So when counsellors, you're thinking that you want to get on Medicare because your life's just going to be easy breezy and you're going to have all of these clients just rocking up, you're going to have a wait list, all this sort of stuff. Remember that you know, it's not all roses and it's not always the grass is greener. Those clients are going to come and see you. They're a different type of client often um, in terms of not only presentation. Well, what I can share with you, again, just my experience, oftentimes clients who present on a um, mental health care plan can be experiencing some serious stuff serious stuff and there's no way on earth six sessions or 10 sessions is ever going to be enough to even scratch the surface i'm talking about people with maybe addiction or people that have um you know trauma that's just like so big long-term trauma um things like that a long chronic depression chronic anxiety it's just not going to be fixed in 10 sessions and so what happens is after those 10 sessions have transpired the psychologist might say hey let's work together you know this is what the fee is you know and that client is so used to not paying for example that they might say do you know what i'll just wait until i get my free ones next year and then they're going to come back next year and you're gonna to have to start all over again and this is why we see um patients consistently like year in year out using their mental health care plan right um when you work as a um, counselor the difference can be that if somebody comes to you with long-term trauma long-term anxiety long-term depression um your the clients that are coming to you don't have the medicare mindset of six sessions and, and 10 sessions they're coming to you with a different outlook and a different mindset and you get to work with them for as long as is required where possible and where ethical of course but there's no constraint there's no i'll just come back next year when the free ones kick in again there's no i'll just come back next year when the rebate ticks over again you're not dealing with that um and that's that can be a really big source of frustration for psychologists because and mental health social workers because towards the end of those 10 sessions that might be when they're just starting to get the breakthroughs and the clients just starting to get the transition and just starting to make the changes and the results are starting to come through and now all of a sudden the clients disappeared because the sessions have run out you don't have to deal with that in um, your counseling private practice because your clients are coming to you under that framework so in that sense you know, it's so good for you because your clients will be with you for as long as they need to be, okay? Again, caveats where it's ethical and where they're getting results. So I just wanted to share this with you and I think it really highlights to me as well, the, the Medicare model um, highlights to me as well the importance to understand your marketing and um, I know so many people don't like it and they don't want to think about it and I get that because I went and did so many marketing courses with other private practices. One was like all about physios and chiros and it was rah, rah. It was talking about, you know, using levers for this and machines for that and blueprints for this. And it was like full on intense, rah, 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 very masculine. And it was so uncomfortable for me to do that training. Somebody else was all about, let's make a million dollars in your practice. That wasn't on my agenda. I didn't want to make a million dollars in my practice, but the things that I was learning were all geared around, how do you get the most money out of this? And how do you get the most money out of that? And what about your team members? And how can you, do you know what I mean? And it was just, again, it was mind blowing because I never thought about private practice like that. But at the same time, it wasn't aligned with me at all. And there was somebody else that I um, went and enrolled in um, a course to learn about, you know, marketing and things like that. And I thought everything was going to work because they showed me the screenshots and the data that showed how it was working for somebody else. But then what happened was when I went to try and use them in um, my practice, they didn't work at all because 
the things aren't ethical. We can't use half the things with our clients because our clients are vulnerable. Um, the sales approaches just don't sit well in our industry, all those kinds of things. So I couldn't use any of that. And it was so flipping frustrating. And I knew that there needed to be another way. And so it was through trial and error that I found a way of marketing. I'm going to share it with you today so that you understand what it is and you can go away and start getting more clients for your private practice with or without Medicare. So the thing that I learned is really that as counsellors and psychologists and social workers, you already have more expertise in marketing than any other marketer. I'll tell you why. It's because you already understand how to build rapport, how to make connections with people, especially people who are brand new to you. You know how to build relationships with people who are in fear, who are nervous, who are hesitant. You know how to create containers don't like that word, but you know how to create containers that help people to feel safe and like they can trust you. You understand all of these sorts of things. You understand active listening. You're better trained than any other profession in communication. So why are you not using these skills that you've already got to market your practice? It's when you understand how to apply these skills that you've already got, you don't have to learn any. All you need to do is learn, okay, how do I take them from over here? How do I take these skills from a counselling session and use them over here to increase my reach, to get more traffic to my website, to get more inquiries, to get more bookings, to get more referrals, to make me and my practice known as the go-to practice in my area? That's all you need to know. And so that's why I wrote Marketing with Soul. It teaches you exactly how to take skills you've already got as therapists and use them to build connections. That's all I think marketing is. I really just think for us in our industry, our best marketing is our ability to create a meaningful connection. So when I do people's website audits, and I've done more than 50 of them in the last couple of months, one of the pieces of feedback that I'll always give them is don't talk about yourself in the third person. On the website, always say, I, me, my, don't use we or or our or anything like that, you know, or these solo um, private practice owners, solo practitioners um, say, you know, at our practice, it, this, that and the other, it's confusing, it doesn't build trust, it, it creates doubt, it, it's very unsettling for people. Um, always try and use stories, okay? Stories, you know this already, stories are going to be more impactful for you than a testimonial and I'll tell you why. In our industry, testimonials don't work. Do they work for Nike? Yes. Do they work for um, Hair House, Warehouse? Yes. Do they work for us? No, because in our industry, again, we're restricted. We've got to behave ethically, which means we can't identify anybody that's giving us those testimonials. It means that, um, you know, if you do, they've got to understand how they can retract their testimonial, if they change their mind down the track, all those kinds of things. So what happens is counsellors end up putting testimonials on their website that says, hey, I really loved working with Brooklyn. And then the signature will be a happy client. That's BS. That means nothing to a client that's coming over to your website. How do they know you didn't make that up? It's not credible. A better way to build your, and the reason that you have the testimonials is to build social proof, right? So social proof simply means, um, do other people like it? Did other people have a nice experience? If other people like me had a good experience, then maybe it's going to work for me too. That's called social proof. That's why you have a testimonial. I have a workaround specific to our industry that we can use. It's called a success story. If you're in Marketing with Soul, if you're in Private Practice 101, you've had the training on it, you know what to do, you know how to write them. I can absolutely tell you that people who share success stories on their website and in their um, social media and in their blogs and things like that, build connections much more quickly with clients than people who just have the testimonials or nothing. And they're the ones who get more inquiries, okay? Whether or not they book them is a whole different thing because you've got to understand what to say to book a client, obviously. Um, a, a mistake that counsellors and psychologists, well, psychologists don't actually do discovery calls for the most part, nor do mental health social workers. Counsellors somehow 
so many of them have on their website that they can do this free 15 minute discovery call or a free 30 minute you know discovery call and this is problematic in your marketing because number one it's not building connection number two no one knows why on earth you want them to call you um you're not telling them why or what they're going to get or what's it about or anything like that um, and worse still, some therapists will write, let's have a conversation to see if you're a good fit and that we shouldn't be doing that, especially with our clients and especially if you're working with clients who have perhaps anxiety or trauma. This can be very triggering for them. You've already said how you're not going to be judging them and you're going to give them a safe space, but now you're telling them, get on a call with me and I'll make a judgment about whether or not you're a good fit for me. If I want to accept you, if I want to work with you, it's not okay. If you're going to do those calls, and I've done podcast episodes on it before, you can go and listen to how to do them. You need to have a name for it. So that title needs to convey something like a result or an outcome that that person's going to experience um, from that call. So you might call it a 15-minute um, get unstuck session where I'm going to ask you a set of questions. At the end of those questions, I will then um, give you three strategies that you can use right away to help you get unstuck. And um, if I feel that I can be of more help to you, I will certainly give you guidance and direction about your next steps, one of which might be to book a session with me. That's it. So now when somebody comes over to your website and you have a niche dealing with overwhelm or something like that, and people say you're going to help them in this 15 minute call, of course, they're going to start booking in. There's your inquiry call. People who have that very clearly defined inquiry call with a really clear call to action, really clear header, lets people know what they're going to get. Um, those people get more bookings of the inquiry calls than people who say um, have a 15 minute discovery call. Your clients don't know what a discovery call is. You might not even know what a discovery call is. Discovery calls came from the counselling industry. The reason that, um, from the coaching industry, I'm sorry, the reason that coaches have them is because coaches charge thousands and thousands of dollars to um, work with them. So, of course, clients need to have an opportunity uh, to speak with the coach and make sure that they're going to be a good fit and make sure that um, this coach is the right person to help them and make sure that they get along and they connect. That's what a discovery call is all about. And people in coaching understand that. But when counsellors start talking about it, it makes no sense. Counsellors often don't understand what a discovery call is. If you don't know what it is, how on earth are your clients going to know what it is? So they're two things. You've got your stories and got your discovery calls. The other thing is your language. So really be mindful that the whole point of your website, the whole point of all of your marketing is to create um, rapport, is to create connection. Okay. You're not going to be able to do that if you're not using... <clears throat> If you're not using language that doesn't resonate with your client, okay? So don't say things like, I help individuals. Say, you know, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you because, you know, I understand what it's like to be a busy working single mum that's juggling all of the balls and doesn't have five minutes to brush her teeth, let alone go for you know, lunch with her girlfriends or something like that. I'm here to help you. Um, and in our 15 minute call, what I'm going to do is help you find time for you to come along and get some support because I know you're busy. I know you've got so much on your plate. You probably can't think, how am I going to find an hour a week for this? Let me help you find that hour so you can come. That's what we're going to focus on in our call, right? Something like that. But always speaking right to your client. And this is why niching is so important. If you want to become the go-to practice um, in your area, you need to have a reason for people to refer to you. So if you say, I work with women who've got anxiety, you might think that's a niche. And it is a niche, but it's so big. What kind of anxiety does she have? A phobia? Does she have um, anxiety about work? Does she have trauma? Like, what is it? Um, and if it's trauma, what type of trauma does your practice specialize in helping people with? Is it road trauma? Is it domestic violence? Is it, is it sexual abuse? Like, what kind of trauma? Now, if I'm a doctor, for example, if I'm a doctor and I've got practice A over here says I help women with anxiety, and um, practice B over here says, I help women who have 
been victims of um, road trauma and I've got a patient with me who was involved in a car accident or some collision or something like that, I know exactly who I'm sending this patient to. I'm going to send it over here to this one that specialises in the road trauma. Now, yes, my client is technically female and has anxiety, but this is so general over here. But this one over here is very specific, so I know this practice is going to be able to help me. If you have been marketing and you're not getting clients, it's because you're not the go-to practice in your area or your niche or your field or your specialty yet. You can fix that when you understand how to market. And I'm giving you some of these tips and insights right now. The other thing too is I have a form that I get people to fill out when I work with them and I ask them, you know, how are you marketing your private practice at the moment? And you know, almost, almost, Every single person says social media. So they say Facebook or Instagram or they just write social media. And then when I go and check their social media, they're not marketing, they're posting. There's a difference between posting on your social media and actually marketing. So when you market, you um, usually have a marketing plan. That marketing plan is usually around 12 months. It's in alignment with your mission and vision and the goals of your practice and all those kinds of things. So the goals could be financial, they could be impact goals, they could be all kinds of things, right? Goals built on your values. And then that plan is broken into quarterly plans. And then within each quarterly plan, you have a strategy and you follow that strategy and you implement that strategy week in, week out. You track your data from the first day of the quarter, right through to the last day of the quarter, you do reviews, you make any tweaks or changes or improvements to bring you closer to the result that you want to get out of the 12 month plan and you start again. But so many therapists are just posting random stuff. It's not branded, it doesn't have their details on it or worse still, they're sharing other people's posts, which is problematic because if you're just starting your practice and you need to have more clients, um, sharing other people's posts drives clients to them. I know this because people share my posts, it drives clients to me instead of them. If you're needing clients for your practice and you're building up your practice, don't share other people's stuff. Have a look at what somebody else has written and if you feel inspired, respond to it in a post. We want to know your point of view. Your clients want to know what you think. They want to know what you stand for. Just like me here today talking about how, you know, Medicare is not the be all and end all. That's my point of view. Now, you can like it or not, but it's my point of view. And this is what builds my audience. If you don't stand for something, you stand for nothing and nobody's ever going to be booking in sessions with you. Okay. So understand there's a difference between posting and marketing. Okay. If you're just posting and there's no plan or strategy behind it and you're not getting inquiries and you're not getting bookings, that's a sure sign you need help with the marketing. What else did I want to say? I think that's pretty much about it for now. But um, counsellors, I really feel, are in such an amazing position to be able to run highly successful private practices in the way that you define success. So it might be financial, it might be impact, it might be the number of clients you get to work with or the changes that you make and the ripple effect, whatever it is, however you define success, you absolutely can be. But when it comes to building a practice, you do not need to be going and talking to doctors as a counsellor. I wouldn't waste my time. Instead of spending, and counsellors do it, they spend all this money, you've got to cater the lunch, you've got to go to Subway, you've got to get the wraps and you've got to make sure that the wraps are all vegetarian, you've got to take them down to the practice, you've got to, you know, get set up, you've got to try and talk to all the doctors as they come in. Oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes the doctors are quite rude. They'll come in, grab a sandwich, say, are you, do you do mental health care plans? You say no, and they're out of there. Um, you don't even get a chance to speak a lot of the time. Um, instead of going to all that trouble to try and get in with a doctor so you get some referrals, why don't you spend that time and having lunch with one of your colleagues and build that relationship? Because did you know that the biggest referrer um, of clients to counsellors is other counsellors, not doctors. 
Doctors refer to um, people who work under Medicare, like psychologists and mental health social workers. They're unlikely to refer to you, okay? What would be better for you if you want to build up your practice is to have a lunch with two or three people. So I've got a free community where you can connect with people to do that. It's called Counselors Connect Australia. If you're not in it, let me know. I'll give you the link. You can absolutely join. It's free, no strings attached, beautiful community. People promote their practices in there every single week. Supervisors get to promote their practice all the time. Um, it's a really lovely, helpful, vibrant, beautiful, comfortable space. Why not come in there and say, hey, my name's Brooklyn. I'm based in Mount Eliza in Victoria. I'm looking to build my referral network. I really want to catch up with other therapists that are in my area. If you're interested, could you please let me know? Why don't you do that and start meeting with a group of you and start connecting so that you can get those referrals flowing. In order for those referrals to flow to you though, you need to also be referring out. This is the other thing. And it's something that happens as well. Um, for example, when I'm, I'm just thinking about the exchange here, but in the free counseling group, for example, you know, every week I put up a post that says, share details about your business. Um, but I would love to know how many people that share their business, that, that post their business links, are actually also going to click in on other links of other businesses and seeing what those other businesses are doing. I mean, if you're just throwing up your own details and you're not interacting with anybody else's business, it's not going to work for you. You need to be interacting with other people's businesses as well, right? That means visiting their page, um, saying to them, oh, I'm really interested in this. You know, um, I work with women's trauma, but I don't work with teenagers. What do I do to refer a teenager to you? Because I don't know, maybe some of these women with trauma have kids and they say, I'm getting so much help from you. Can you see my teenager? And you say no, but I know somebody who does. And then they pass on your details. So this is how it works. It's got to be give and take, give and take all the time, okay? It's how you're going to build up your practice. And it is more powerful and it works more quickly than trying to get referrals from doctors, okay, as counsellors. So if you're a counsellor, please don't panic about being on Medicare or not, okay? It's not the be all and end all. You <coughs> Sorry, buddy, buddy. You're in a really good position, buddy. Yeah, buddy. You're in a really good position, buddy, buddy, come. You're in a really good position to be able to build up your practice without all of without all of the drama of Medicare, okay? The grass isn't always greener. If you understand how to, buddy, if you understand, come, if you understand how to uh, market your practice, you can be fully booked. Somebody in one of my groups this week was sharing how in one of my programs, she became fully booked in nine weeks, okay? And she's brand new. She's brand new. She doesn't have 10 years experience. She doesn't have big networks or anything like that. But she went through the program. She's fully booked, nine weeks. I'm going to drop the information um, to Marketing with Soul in the link for you. Um, in the comments for you. The other thing too is if you're thinking of starting a private practice, I'm hosting a free workshop. I'll put the link to that as well. It's on Monday night, the 8th of April at 7 p.m. It's online. Um, hopefully you can come. Um, there is an opportunity for you to submit questions as well if you've got any beforehand. Um, and I'll also be giving you a private practice resource that can help you with getting set up and help you get clients as well. And it's all free. It's just something that I want to do. Um, I'm also opening the doors to private practice 101 um, that night as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have around private practice 101. It opens twice a year. It's a 12 month course that teaches you how to start your private practice and get all the foundations in place ethically the right way, right from the beginning. So I hope that this was a helpful um, video. I hope it was a helpful um, podcast. Yes, if you're listening on the podcast, I'll put all those links for you in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. So wonderful to be back um, with the microphone instead of doing these in the car. <laughs> and um, I will see you on Saturday for the next episode. 
If there's anything you want me to talk about, of course, don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. I'm always open to topics for you. But um, please do consider getting on top of your marketing, okay? This can be your year for private practice. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.